Hello, I'm Bukhar Rizvi, and this is Scope. We're going to start off today's show by discussing Iran. Now, that country had requested the IMF for a $5 billion emergency loan to be able to deal with the fallout from the coronavirus pandemic in that country. We know that Iran has been one of the countries around the world that has been quite hard hit by that pandemic, especially in context of the fact that that country is already suffering from very harsh sanctions placed by the United States on it uh, ever since the U.S. decided to walk away from the JCPOA or the nuclear deal. Um, now, at this point in time, news is coming out that the U.S. will and will want to block the IMF request from going through. Um, at this point in time, that pretty much seems like the nail in the coffin for Iran to be able to get that money um, because the U.S. does have significant influence over the IMF. It doesn't have complete veto power, mind you. It holds about 17% or so of the uh, voting power at the IMF at this point in time, but would certainly want to then get on other allied countries onto its side. Within that context, so the Europeans are still trying to do, at least on the outside, their part uh, to help Iran uh, get through this situation that it's suffering from because of coronavirus. Um, it, we know that Instex was just recently used to be able to get some humanitarian aid into Iran, and there is talk about further aid being provided by the Europeans to Iran in this time. And the Europeans at the IMF, interestingly, are supporting Iran's request for that loan. Let's discuss all of that a bit further. We're now joined by Barbara Savin, who is uh, Director of the Future of Iran Initiative at the Atlantic Council. She's joining us from Washington, D.C. Also joining us from D.C. this morning is Reza Khanzadeh, who is a research fellow at the Sharif University Think Tank, which is based in Tehran. He's also a Ph.D. candidate at the University of Oxford. Reza and Barbara, thank you both for your time this morning. Uh, Barbara, let me start with you. Um, if uh, the IMF were to reject uh, Iran's request for this loan, how devastating would that be? For $5 billion, which is not a huge sum, I think symbolically it would be more damaging. And I'm not convinced yet that the loan is not going to go through. Iran also has recourse to uh, more than a billion dollars, I believe, that it has on deposit with the IMF. And there was another, um, another event that occurred uh, the other day, Luxembourg, where apparently Iran has over a billion dollars in uh, in funds in banks there, said that it would release that money for humanitarian transactions. So I think there are a number of ways, you mentioned Instex, in which Iran may be able to get access to its own money in the IMF, in uh, banks in Europe and in other places to help it get through this emergency. Do you think, though, Barbara, that the IMF as a whole has this sort of appetite to get into this back and forth with the U.S.? I mean, we know how Donald Trump functions, right? So if you would have an international organization like the IMF going against his wishes, that wouldn't go down very well with him, would it? Look, it's a test. Uh, President Trump has been uh, vehement in opposing almost all international institutions, whether it's the IMF, the U.N., the WHO, NATO. Uh, so I'm not sure that that alone would, would be sufficient to block it. This is, you know, one of the things that's going on now is that Iran is presenting its case to the IMF. It's explaining how it would use the money as a way to deflect criticism from the United States that Iran would somehow divert the money to, to fund the IRGC or militias in Iraq or, or Hezbollah in Lebanon. Uh, so I think the process is still continuing. My information is that it's not over yet. All right, so Reza, tell me, tell me what your thoughts are on this, because as, as Barbara there, you know as well, the U.S. Um, is concerned, at least in its own words, that this money would be re diverted towards other uses, such as Iran's quote-unquote regional role. Uh, do you think that that would happen, um, and that Iran can in some way be transparent about, okay, it, how, how exactly it's going to use this money uh, if it does get it? Yeah, I do, I do, I do believe that... Um, that Iran can be transparent. Now, will they be is, is another question. Um, but I fear that um, this type of approach by Iran um, has, has more to do with a foreign policy and political tactics towards, towards the United States. Uh, rather than actually thinking that they would be able to get their hands on that $5 billion, you know, dollars. Um, we have this, this tick for tack back and forth, either, either through Iraq or through their rhetoric between Tehran and Washington, where you have Washington 
um, claiming or stating that Tehran is is performing nuclear extortion by you know continuing to enrich its uranium, and then you have Tehran, and then you know particularly Zarif calling out Washington, saying that they're performing medical terrorism. Um, so I feel like a portion of this, um, you know, request by Tehran for the $5 billion um, has somewhat little to do with them needing that money to fight the virus, because according to Johns Hopkins, March 29th, I believe, was when Iran hit its peak. And since then, it has been decreasing mm. as far as the number of cases and the you know, number of deaths. Um, so, yeah, I, I, yeah, as far as the transparency, I don't think that would that would really happen. Okay. Um, as far as them, you know, needing that money, I don't, I don't see that happening either. All right, so let, let's talk for a moment, Reza, about what the point you just made there, there about this is possibly just symbolic, right? And uh, possibly just diplomacy, where it's Iran almost using this for to, to prove bad optics, really, on the part of the United States. In that sense, do you think it's smart of Iran to be doing this? Because it certainly has always wanted these sanctions to be lifted anyhow, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. Um, and smart in the sense, I believe, for its for its domestic base, um, because just getting back from Iran, uh, speaking speaking with the youth there, speaking with um, mid-level members of the government there, um, there is this growing sense that although um, the people are getting frustrated or tired with the government, um, there, there really isn't a sense yet that there might be a grand, you know, revolt or a grand protest. Mm -hmm. So Tehran still has to push this rhetoric that, that you know, the U.S. is the bad guy, U.S. is the great Satan, as they put it, mm -hmm. and it's their fault as to why we, as your government, we as you know, the Islamic Republic of Iran, are unable to you know, provide certain things for you. When in fact, if you look at the problems, not not all, of course, but if you look at many, if not most of the problems that that Tehran has faced and, you know, fighting off this virus, major European countries have also faced the same problems. And it's not so much as um, you can't blame it all on sanctions. You can't blame it all on not getting that $5 billion. Yeah. Um, it has to do with that government just not being ready to face that virus, and mm. it's you know, like I said, it's not just Tehran. If, if you if you've seen recently, major major European countries are having the same problems, yeah. and also U.S. is having the same problems as well. Yeah. All right. So Barbara, I wanted to bring in the European factor into this. I mentioned this earlier, and you alluded to it also. But do you think that the division between Europe and the United States over how to deal with Iran, um, you know, over be it instex or otherwise, even other aid? and Europe's support for Iran even at the IMF at this point, vis-a-vis -vis this loan. Um, does that throw a spanner into the works for what Donald Trump would want to happen vis-a-vis -vis a maximum pressure campaign? I mean, if Europe goes along and keeps providing this sort of aid to Iran, then that sort of goes against what he wants, right? Yeah, well, you're, well Europe, it's taken Europe an awful long time even to get Instex up and running. So it's not as though Europe has been able to do that much to help Iran, but they are providing some humanitarian assistance. and. Uh, and diplomatic assistance, which I think is is important. Look, uh, the so-called maximum pressure campaign has been a maximum failure, uh, in 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 my uh, view, ever since the United States pulled out, but especially since the United States imposed what amounts to an oil embargo embargo on Iran. Uh, Iran has been lashing out in terms of regional provocations, in terms of attacks on Americans through uh, militias in Iraq. Uh, it, it simply has not worked. It's produced uh, more provocative actions by Iran, not less. And Iran, of course, has not come back to the negotiating table. It's expanding its nuclear program, as, as you pointed out. So to my mind, the, the crisis over this virus provides an opportunity for both sides to tone it down and to begin to seek some de-escalation of tensions. Uh, it's possible that the Trump administration is actually beginning to do that. It just doesn't want to advertise it. It's continuing the information war, uh, you know, with Zarif and Pompeo essentially trolling each other 
on the issue of who's worse at, at treating the coronavirus. Um, but uh, Instex, the first transaction went through. We will see about the IMF loan. I mentioned Luxembourg saying Iran can have access to more than a billion dollars in its banks. Um, will the U.S. try to, bro uh, to block that or will it facilitate? Uh, so there, there are a number of, of questions out there. Uh, even Mike Pompeo, who is an enormous hawk on Iran, uh, has suggested that there might be some flexibility on sanctions. And uh, we have seen a pause also in the tit-for-tat violence in Iraq, which is a good thing. Indeed. So let's let's talk about Pompeo for a moment, Reza, because it also said, um, as as uh, Barbara there alluded to, that there is possibly some flexibility on the part of these sanctions, saying that they're always under consideration, are being reevaluated uh, on a regular basis, according to what he said. And he also has insisted, uh, as have other U.S. officials, that the sanctions that have been placed on Iran uh, do not block humanitarian supplies. But we know, of course, the background and the context to that, where banks then aren't willing to provide the sort of uh, safety net that would be needed for any country around the world to be able to actually provide that sort of aid or supplies to uh, to the Islamic Republic. So what are your thoughts about what the U.S. Uh, is thinking at this point? And is it, as Barbara there said, behind the scenes, probably there is some um, movement? Yeah, I do. I do agree with Barbara to a certain extent um, that um, there is there is a certain degree of movement you know, behind the scenes. Um, but hearing hearing the State Department or hearing Pompeo speak about, you know, reviewing the options about how and when and in what capacity to lift sanctions, to me, um, there's no difference than when they make comments saying that all options are on the table, including, you know, military strikes. Um, so uh, I'm not hopeful. I don't feel that there would be any type of sanctions relief. Um, and, you know, like I said, since since March 29th, uh, Iran has been doing an increasingly better job of, you know, curbing, um, like, the rise in the cases and deaths. And, yeah, unfortunately, I just, I just don't see any kind of scenario, really, where the State Department, Pompeo, Trump's, you know, cabinet administration is willing to um, ease because they've Trump has constantly doubled down on this maximum pressure. And even though I do agree with Barbara that it's been um, a failure, uh, nonetheless, I believe Trump will continue to double down on that. All right, Barbara, I'll give you the final word. Um, the, the goal, seemingly, of the United States at this point, right, when it comes to Iran and uh, through this maximum pressure campaign is to bring Iran back to the negotiating table and negotiate uh, a tougher deal, which would be more encompassing, such as its regional role, ballistic missiles, and, of course, the, the nuclear program also. Uh, do you think that that is likely to happen? I mean, there is a way to maneuver that there into this, as you said, right, where if there is some movement behind the scenes, which may or may not be happening, of course, we, don't, we can't know 100 percent either way, but is there not a way for the, the Americans to almost entrap the, the Iranians where if they show some goodwill, then the Iranians would in some way need to take a step forward towards them too? Look, I, I think the chances are rather small. I think Iranians are watching the polls in the United States very carefully right now. Uh, the polls are, are showing that Joe Biden has a very good chance of replacing Donald Trump as uh, president of the United States. Um, they won't rule out talks, obviously, but they have insisted that there has to be some sort of sanctions relief before they would return to the table. Um, the most I'm expecting and, and hoping for is that things stay calm, that we don't see any more fighting in Iraq in particular or elsewhere in, in the region, and that the United States allows Europe, other parties, to provide some relief to Iran, perhaps uh, pauses the um, addition of sanctions by the United States. But um, I'm not looking for any great breakthrough, I'm afraid, this, uh, this summer or fall. Very well. We'll leave it there at that. But of course, we appreciate both Barbara and Reza time this morning and of course for providing the context of, for this discussion. Um, as we know, at this point in time, that IMF loan hangs in the balance. Uh, $5 billion, as Reza there said, um, it may not be the most significant amount of money, right? It may just be more about symbolism at this point in time, even on the part of the Islamic Republic, where it wants 
this loan as if to prove a point, right, where it needs this money. It's trying to make the point that these sanctions that it's currently under are harsh and are making its fight against the coronavirus pandemic that much harder, which is an undeniable fact to an extent. Um, and then, of course, we also need to then take into account mismanagement, bad planning, et cetera, which, uh, frankly, we can we can probably extend to many countries around the world as well, considering such a pandemic is something that comes out of the blue. And you can't always plan for something like that to happen and snap into place immediately once it does occur. But nevertheless, um, do we are we having negotiations behind the scenes, as Barbara there may have alluded to? Uh, we don't know that 100 percent. Certainly, we don't know if that will result in in any good relations between the two nations, which have had, of course, adversarial relations for so many years. But that would be significant if there would be some step forward, because Pompeo also said that the United States is always reviewing the sanctions that it has placed on Iran uh, on a regular basis. We'll keep a close eye on that, of course, here in Skolp. I'll be back with my next segment, though, after this. Welcome back, viewers. You're still here on Scope with me, Rakhar Rizvi. In this segment, we're going to discuss the leader of the WHO, Dr. Tedros Adhanem Ghebreyesus, uh, who's made a statement uh, recently saying that he's received death threats and racist insults uh, while, of course, running the global efforts to fight the coronavirus pandemic. Um, in part, he says, uh, some of that has come from Taiwan, but uh, I would imagine that a lot of uh, those threats possibly would have increased ever since Donald Trump also went after him. Um, and I actually want to, before getting to our guests, I actually want to play a video soundbite of uh, Dr. Tedros speaking about those threats because I think it's best to hear them from himself. I can tell you personal attacks that has been going on for more than two, three months. Abuses. Or racist comments. Giving me names black or negro i'm proud of being black or bl proud of being negro because that negro is black black is black and i'm proud i don't care to be honest and thank you for asking that question maybe for the first time i would make this public even death threat i don't give a damn because it's personally at, targeted to me. Three months in the same situation. All right, those are powerful words there. If we understand the context of, of who the, the head of the WHO currently is, he's an Ethiopian microbiologist, so he is, by any definition, a qualified man for this position. Secondly, he is the first African also to hold that position. That is also a significant fact to keep in mind at this point in time. Well, let's now introduce our guests who are joining us for this segment. We're joined now by Bina Kandola, who is an author. He specializes in how biases affect decision-making and behavior in organizations. His recent book is entitled Racism at Work, The Danger of Indifference. He's joining us now from Oxford in the UK. Joining us from the Italian capital of Rome is Lyle Asunga, who is a visiting professor at the Raoul Wallenberg Institute of Human Rights and Humanitarian Law. Uh, let's now go firstly to you, Bina. Um, what do you make of Dr. Tedros's um, comments, it does come off as disturbing, doesn't it? Because this is in a context where we know ever since the coronavirus pandemic has begun, there have been racist attacks against Asians across the world, really. Um, and then there was even those statements by French scientists about how vaccines, vaccines should be tested in Africa. I think, I think your observations are actually very good, very good, actually. The, the, uh, there seems to have been an increase. We, we, we're doing some research now in the United Kingdom, um, looking at the increase in racism that's, as it's experienced by the British-born Chinese community. And it's clearly uh, demonstrated in our data that there has been an increase in racism. And that is fueled in part, I think, by political leaders um, making references to this being a Chinese disease. Um, Donald Trump obviously being the, um, being the person I'm talking about here. Um, and having a, a minority in, in the UK, in the West context, actually ha having somebody who's in a minority in a leadership position um, is unusual. And consequently, um, what my our research has found, found is that where you find uh, people from a minority, I'm talking from a UK context here, yeah. uh, in leadership roles, they are undermined 
and people find all sorts of ways of undermining them. Some very uh, overt, as the leader of the WHO has found, and, and some of it can be quite subtle as well. Lyle, what are, what are your thoughts about? Because, you know, uh, obviously, as, as the head of the WHO, as anybody who is in a leadership position, there may very well be legitimate crit criticism, right, of Dr. Tedros and his track record so far. But why does that then need to include his race, um, et cetera, do you think? Well, you're absolutely right that, um, you know, nobody's leadership is beyond uh, criticism and uh, no institution should be beyond criticism. It's through crit criticism that... Um, you know, we can always do better, and that's true for all of us. But that's a very different thing from um, racist uh, attacks or ad hominem attacks that he has been uh, receiving. I wanted to underline another point, which is um, that, first of all, a couple of points. One is that, um, you know, the uh, Dr. Tedros uh, Gabriesus, uh, I, I, I commend him for, for coming out with uh, uh, the statement and exposing the kind of uh, nonsense that he's been uh, subjected to. So that's that's very important. And also, uh, Professor Candola's uh, research and monitoring of this in the UK, this kind of instances, that we're seeing from individuals uh, all around the world, and you can do an easy uh, search, and you find that it's everywhere in the world. Uh, even, you know, mainland Chinese were first um, discriminating against people from Hubei and the Hubei people first before that from people from Wuhan and then Hong Kongers against mainlanders and then you find it in Europe and different countries. But there is a, uh, you know, a quantum leap between individual instances uh, and racism is always latent and it comes out in these kind of fear-driven situations. When, uh, compare that with a head of state of the you know, United States, an important country, obviously, the world's remaining superpower, um, spreading this kind of association, uh, calling it the Chinese virus. So that, that is very, very irresponsible on part yeah. of President Trump. Indeed. Uh, Bina, you know, how does this racism, how do these sort of death threats then hurt um, the work that needs to be done, right? Because at this point in time, as Dr. Tedros has also said, listen, can we just get past this politicization of this issue and just work together at this point in time? It can make it difficult. I, mean, it, I, I thought his statement was very, it, there was obviously very, a lot of emotion there. And it, he managed to, and it was also very measured. Uh, he was saying what he was distinguishing between was personal attacks and attacks against the work and attacks against a, 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 a group of people, a nation, uh, a continent. And the personal attacks, they have hurt him. I don't have any doubt about that at all. But what he's valiantly trying to do, I think, is distinguishing between his own personal hurt and the way that this then affects the work that he is trying to do and the World Health Organization is trying to do. And he said this has been going on for three months. I mean, that's a long time to stay silent about these things. And there are risks about him speaking up about this too. For him, I mean. Indeed. Indeed. So, Lyle, what are your thoughts about that? Because, you know, in a leadership position, when you're trying to, you know, for good or bad, whether you're doing a good job or not, you're nevertheless trying to manage this worldwide pandemic, which, again, you know, even a person in his position would not have foreseen this coming, right? I mean, uh, he, at least on paper, um, seemingly did send out warning signals the moment uh, his organization realized this was something that countries around the world needed to deal with. Um, you know, in that context, this makes his job that much harder, right? Because we're adding a whole other factor into this, which isn't really helping anybody. Well, um, I wouldn't worry too, too much about uh, Dr. Tedros uh, Ghebreyesus. He's very, very um, experienced and he's a solid guy who I don't think will be too much hurt. I mean, you're absolutely right that, of course, it doesn't, it doesn't help him at all. Um, however, um, his, uh, I very much like his statement because um, what he went on from the, the the personal attacks which he rightly underlined and uh, i'm sorry you know it's it's a shame that that these things have happened um but he he then went on um to underline uh individual and social responsibility um to make sure that we all take care of our neighbors and each other and regardless of of uh race uh, religion background etc cetera, etc cetera. So I think the bigger worry is one that uh, he underlined very, very well, which is uh, about uh, social responsibility. And he said that the virus, you know, creeps in 
where society is, um, the national unity is undermined and that there's fissures across ideological, political uh, divides. And so I think it's a very important message, and, and I, was, I was quite pleased to see that. And, it, and perhaps we'll have a moment to also debate that, um, you know, the, the virus has had an astounding, uh, an astonishing effect on uh, vulnerable, more vulnerable parts of the population, those that are uh, suffering from poverty and weaker access to, to health and who are not uh, taken as seriously when they go to a doctor, and those are often visible minorities. And we see this laboratory experiment, uh, unfortunately, uh, in, in uh, Sanjay Gupta from CNN was mentioning about uh, Michigan and Illinois, where you have one third, uh, 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 13 percent of the population that's, is African American, that there, there are 31 percent of the cases, or 14 percent in Michigan, and 41 percent of the uh, COVID deaths. Yeah. So um, there are uh, vulnerabilities there that uh, we also have to take uh, account of because uh, it's, it's a human problem. and trying to say that it's, um, and there's a lot of misinformation, disinformation out there, rumors that it only affects certain people and not others, etc. cetera, um, that is also uh, does a great disservice. Indeed. You know, um, uh, Bina, one of the that came out uh, as I was reading more and more about the story is that uh, it seems that for a lot of countries, actually, I would say from pretty much every country around the world, um, as I put in my introduction as well, no one foresees this level of a pandemic, right? So, I mean, you, you certainly want to have as many emergency measures which you can snap into place, but no one's fully ever prepared for this sort of scenario. So everyone was sort of caught off guard and everyone's trying to do in their respective context the best that they can do. Um, but there is, in this, in this sense, do you don't think that WHO or any other international organization would become an easy scapegoat for leaders such as Donald Trump at this point? Um, be they, you know, be, be they using that sort of racist language or just putting blame on somebody else for their own failures in this regard? Yeah, yeah. And I think that uh, um, finding scapegoats is... It, groups being scapegoated has always been a way of uh, people being racist, actually blaming somebody for their own misfortunes. It's a finding an easy target in the research that we've been doing, that we're doing now, actually, that some people of Chinese heritage are saying that uh, they are being blamed and scapegoated uh, for this virus affecting the United Kingdom. It's clearly ridiculous. But we like to have a target. We like to have somebody to blame uh, for, for things like this. As, as Professor Sunga said about um, the WHO, it can be criticised as an organisation. The, the head of the, the WHO can be criticised as the leader. It's where it kind of, the, the, it's being used, what uh, Dr Tedros is saying is about direct, overt attacks on him. But sometimes uh, the criticism of him could be founded in racist beliefs and it's just being expressed in indirect ways. Uh, and that's very difficult then to untangle. And that's a very clever way of being racist, actually. Indeed. Um, Lyle, let, let's talk then about, uh, very gently if we can, about the, the African angle on all of this, right? Because we had, A, those French scientists who have, by the way, denied that and have said that their, their conversation was possibly taken out of context. They didn't mean to have those vaccines tested in Africa, whether we believe their, you know, th their words or not now in their defense of what they had said on TV at that point in time or not. Nevertheless, that's what was perceived by many of us around the world, that what they were saying was that this vaccine should be tested on Africans. Um, and then we have, as you, as you alluded to as well, uh, Lyle, the fact that within the United States is African-Americans who are by far and disproportionately being affected by COVID-19. In fact, they're the ones who are uh, with the highest cases and even actually the death rate is higher amongst that group. Uh, what do you make of that? Because that seems to be a huge factor, which uh, I think a lot of us are ignoring around the world. Well, I don't, I don't know about the French uh, scientists or what, what, what may have been said or thought to have been said there. But um, getting to the underlying uh, structural inequalities that you find, um, and it, for example, in the United States, it's a good example where there is disparate access to health care. Um, that's why you're seeing a very pronounced um, higher per capita rate of COVID deaths um, in, you know, that are great, grossly overrepresented uh, than the percentage of the population. Um, another worry is that, uh, you know, any country with weak healthcare systems, or maybe in developing countries, 
are developed countries as well that do not have universal health care. Uh, you know, uh, us in the human rights field have been saying for, for decades, and uh, it's a big message, you know, human rights are a universal concern. And this just really emphasizes that, uh, you know, one, one person's ill, uh, one person's uh, difficulties uh, can affect everyone. And this is a very, very dramatic example of that. So I'm worried very much about uh, persons that are part of uh, vulnerable groups and also in countries where uh, they don't report any uh, COVID, but uh, their testing is close to zero yeah. or uh, the um, uh, health care system is very, very weak. So um, we're all in this together and uh, it's, it's uh, going to come back and bite us uh, very hard. Um, all these things. So universal health care and, 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 uh, and a greater equality and these structural inequalities are very, very well um, demonstrated in stark relief uh, by this virus. And I think these, these are health concerns and looking at things from a human rights point of view would help a lot, not uh, spreading racism and rumors and disinformation and misinformation. No, very well said. Uh, Bina, I wonder what your thoughts are on that. We've had a couple of politicians, haven't we, around the world saying that this is the great equalizer. This is a great leveler, I believe, is one of the British politicians has said. But then we've had this BBC Newsnight presenter who uh, you may have watched that segment, uh, her, her intro, where she spoke about the fact that, sure, that this, this virus does affect everybody. But then the resulting care that, the, that respective minorities versus the elite may be provided is quite different. And that's the case, uh, be it in the UK or be it in the US or really any other country around the world. So that again goes to show the inequalities within our respective societies globally. How important is that factor to highlight too? Oh, it's it, it really important to highlight. I, I don't think people are necessarily receptive to that message at the moment because everybody is feeling threatened by the virus in every part of the world. But it is something that needs to be said, as Professor Sunga was saying, but also it needs to be reiterated once we're past this crisis and when the analysis and the reporting of what actually happened uh, is carried out, that this will need to be an essential part of it, that some people, uh, and that because of inequality that exists within society, some people were impacted probably, uh, it looks like that would be the case, more than others. And we do need to talk about these things. Indeed. Uh, so, Bina, let me, let me stick with you, because it, just within the UK itself, we also have this new immigration plan coming to place, right? And we know that a lot of the what are called low-skilled workers, which is, again, that term I don't like to use, but that's the one that is used uh, more often, uh, that they will be under threat, really, under this new immigration system, even though, in fact, it's been proven that it is these, quote-unquote, low-skilled workers who are actually proving to be the ones who are very vital to keep society going at this time. They're the ones who bring us our groceries, uh, et cetera, right, at this point in time, as we sit at home in the luxury, quote unquote, of our respective lockdowns. Um, what do you make of that and how that will be dealt with? Do you think that the governments will be revisiting such policies? I, I, they will have to revisit them in, in any case, I think, because I think the, the, um, there'll have to be some flexibility in the system. And I believe that the, before the virus, I seem to remember the Home Secretary saying that the, it'll be dependent on need, who's, who uh, the immigration policy will be de dependent on need of the nation at that moment in time. So I think there is some flexibility there. But without a doubt, the, um, the, the, some of the roles, some of the jobs that need to be carried out um, are not necessarily those jobs that people in the United Kingdom who were born and bred in the United Kingdom necessarily find attractive to do. So somebody will have to do them. So whilst we're talking about, and we do need to talk about and, and express gratitude to doctors and nurses and all the healthcare workers, we still need cleaners in the hospital. The people who are keeping the hospitals clean enough for people to be attended to, they're not, they're not jobs that people typically are drawing attention to during this crisis, and we need people to do them. Indeed. Uh, Lyle, I'll give you the final word. Uh, do you think that there will be almost a reordering of a lot of the way that we look at the world around us uh, in the aftermath of this coronavirus pandemic, when um, hopefully you know, we're, we're looking at post-coronavirus? Do you think that we'll look at things differently, be it races or be it otherwise? Well, I think that uh, uh, it's clear that this coronavirus is affecting, um, you know, the economic situation very clearly, the political situation, and how people look at one another. And um, 
I don't know uh, whether things are going to be in a more positive direction or a more negative direction in total, if we can say that. I think there's a lot of tendencies and, and push and pull factors each way. One of them, in terms of dangers, is the um, uh, you know, uh, push towards nationalism um, and intolerance and right-wing politics. This is uh, definitely giving uh, a big push towards racism and xenophobia and, and racial discrimination of all sorts that we've seen. So that's, that's the, really the downside. Um, I hope that uh, the, the more uh, optimistic view would take hold that people would recognize that we're, as I say, all in this together and that human rights have to be bolstered. Otherwise, uh, we, we all suffer. And I, I hope we're going to go in that direction. But I'd like to see a reordering towards much fuller uh, promotion and protection of human rights, including the right to health in, in, in all its uh, guises. Yeah. And, okay. Uh, Fingers crossed. Guard, uh, of course, let me thank both Lyle and Bina for their time today and for, for giving us their expert insight on this topic. Um, it's disturbing, isn't it, when you have this sort of a, a leader of this important organization, uh, which is trying to at least... Uh, seemingly help the world get past this coronavirus pandemic and deal with it within each nation's specific capacity. That doesn't mean that, of course, uh, Dr. Tedros should not be criticized where it's legitimate or the WHO. But why then bring in his race or why then even, you know, uh, give him death threats? Um, is that called for in this sort of context? Um, maybe it's just about, as we spoke with our guests, about scapegoating him and the organization for each respective countries, especially those in the developing world, and their failures in being able to deal with this pandemic within their own borders. Um, and so, I mean, this sort of talk is completely uncalled for. These sort of threats are completely uncalled for in any context, really, but especially in this context. And it's quite brave of him to come out and say so. Again, that does not mean that he, there is not legitimate criticism of him to be had, but it just doesn't need to do with the fact that he is the first African to lead the WHO. That may very well be making many people around the world quite uncomfortable. I'll leave it there for now. I've been Wakar Rizvi. Thanks for watching.